Um, in as much as I'm going to talk about open educational resources, I should start by saying that this set of slides is an open educational resource. And I'll say more about what this green button means here uh, in a moment. But let me start. It's fortuitous uh, the way that you frame this conversation, because I want to start by talking about education as well and about the nature of education. And I want to argue for a minute that education is sharing and that in the big Venn diagram of, uh, of the universe, there's sharing, which is a bigger circle, and that education falls wholly inside of that broader circle of, of sharing. And by education, I don't mean you know, hunting for parking. I don't mean sitting in faculty meeting. I don't mean the endless hours spent on preparing for tenure and promotion and things like that. I mean the actual educative acts. Uh, that we engage in. So education is first about sharing what you know with your students. It's about sharing feedback with them on work that they prepare and submit to you. It's about sharing encouragement with them as it looks like they're getting it, or sometimes more importantly, when it looks like they're not getting it and they're doubting whether they're ever going to get it. It's about sharing your passion for your discipline and hopefully infecting them a little bit so that they decide they want to become uh, you know, economists or educators or whatever it is that you are. And when you uh, think about it, really, it's about sharing something of yourself with your students. That's what great educators do. When you think about the educators who inspired you in your past, um, I think you would agree that they shared something of themselves. So, you know, the internet has been called a sharing machine. Um, it's pretty clear that over time, kind of the march of technology here is one that has made our capability to share information with each other cheaper and easier uh, in terms of copying and distributing uh, a, a book, for example. And it turns out that if you go to Google and look, you can find people who are still willing to hand copy books for you because you can find anything on the internet. Uh, but that's fun. But essentially, from you know, thousands of dollars to produce a handwritten copy and move that around the world the way that it was previously moved around the world to where we find ourselves today, um, where it's essentially free to make perfect copies and distribute them at the speed of light around the world. And so that gives us an unprecedented technical capacity uh, for sharing. And now I, I want to introduce at this point uh, some, I'm going to be showing some student work during my talk today. I'm, I'm teaching a, a graduate seminar right now on uh, openness in education. And one of the things I have them do each week is I have them create memes to summarize the, the topics uh, of each week. And uh, this one's about sharing. But when you see some animated GIFs popping up and things, just know that this is some student work. You can find the attributions here at the bottom. But what if I told you that we could share without running out of the thing we're sharing? When we share digitally, when you share a YouTube video with someone else, it's different from sharing a DVD with someone else. Because when you share your DVD with them while they're watching it, you can't watch it anymore because they have it. But if that movie is put online and it's made digital, we can all watch it at the same time. A hundred of us, a thousand of us, a million of us can watch that same digital video at the same time. So the internet gives us this amazing capacity to share. And in as much as education is sharing, then the internet uh, gives us an amazing capacity to engage in education except that it doesn't. So long before the uh, internet was even a, a twinkle in an engineer's eye, there was copyright. And if we come back to this slide about the way that uh, technology makes it easier for us to copy and distribute information, we can actually put a heading on the left-hand side here, which is uh, types of activity that copyright regulates. Right? Copyright regulates four kinds of activities, and two of those are copying and distributing. And so it sets up this, um, this tension, which is a tension that's been playing out in different fields for the last decade at least, in that what the internet te technologically enables us to do, copyright prohibits us from doing. Right? The internet makes it possible for us to make an infinite number of perfect copies for free and send them anywhere around the world. And the music industry was the first to kind of learn the hard lesson of what the technology enabled. Um, but eventually, copyright law caught up with them, and Napster is no more. But then there are better 
better versions of Napster-like tools, things like BitTorrent, and now DVDs are passed around in this way, so the movie industry is learning this lesson again. But uh, this, is a, this is a fundamental tension that our society is dealing with, and it touches us uh, in education as well. So, of course, I'm not here to say that we should all break the law to take full advantage of the internet, but I'm also not here to say that we should just uh, ignore all the opportunities the internet creates for us in education because the law says something different. How, how can we resolve this tension? So I'm going to talk about open educational resources as a way of resolving this tension between what's possible and what's permitted. Um, you know, in, in, in the style of a thesis defense, I'll begin by defining terms here so that we're all clear about what we're talking about because it matters deeply. Uh, it, it matters deeply. When we say open, what do we mean by open? And there's some confusion, uh, I think, that is pretty widespread that open is essentially a synonym for free. And I want to disabuse you of that right away. The internet is already free to, to read, to watch, to listen to. You don't pay to read tweets or to watch videos on YouTube or to read the news on CNN or look at photos on Instagram. The, the whole internet is already free. If all that we meant by open was free, we wouldn't need a new word. We'd just call it free. Open means a free grant of permissions. Um, and specifically, a free grant of permission to engage in what we call the 5R activities. These are, uh, as you, I'm not going to violate the first rule of PowerPoint and read the slide to you. I'll just pause for a moment and let you do that. But when we say the word open, we mean <clears throat> that someone has given us a formal uh, copyright license to engage in all of these activities. And they've given us that set of permissions. They've given us that license for free. Now, just to say a little bit about these, um, I do want to point out that retain is the fundamental permission here. The, the permission or the right to own, a, to make a copy, to own that copy, and control that copy. Um, it's, it's becoming an increasingly unique thing in a world of Netflix and Hulu and Spotify and Pandora and library databases. Um, that we never get to own things anymore. We pay a monthly access fee, and for the next four weeks, we have permission to stream that movie from Netflix or stream that TV show from Hulu or view that PDF through the library, uh, but we're, we're not allowed to own. Uh, nobody wants us to own anymore, but owning, being able to make a copy that you keep forever, that doesn't delete itself after six months, that doesn't blow up because of some DRM that's built into it, is fundamental to enabling you to do the rest of uh, these other things. So this idea of ownership of private property turns out to be important. And the implications of these five R permissions are many, but just let me point out three. First, when you have permission to retain and redistribute, when you have permission to download copies and to share those copies, what that essentially means is that everyone can have free copies. All that material is essentially made available to everyone for free because you have permission to make your own copies and you have permissions uh, to share those with others. Revise and remix mean that we can edit, we can improve, we can customize, we can localize, we can adapt. And we can do that either individually, kind of in our own offices, or we can collaborate with others. And we can have those collaborations in the open, in the public sphere, with colleagues from other institutions. We don't have to hide in our offices behind some claim of fair use that what we're doing is OK as long as we don't let it out into the wild. We can collaborate at internet scale. And then re this right to reuse means that we're not just stuck in uh, some legal sense in formal educational settings. It's not just about the classroom or about labs, but it's about study groups and tutorials and outside of school and uh, community groups and a wide range of, of other areas. Now, in as much as we're talking about providing a formal grant of permissions, um, we have to do that in a formal legal way. And how many of you know about Creative Commons by show of hands? Several of you do. Okay. So all I will say about Creative Commons then is that 
Uh, Creative Commons is a, a nonprofit organization that creates copyright licenses that grant people these 5R permissions. And they make those licenses available for free so that you as the author of an article or a video or whatever it might be can apply this license to your own work and by means of that tell the world that they have these permissions. So they don't have to call you, they don't have to ask, they don't have to email you and wait for you to respond. You just tell them, by default, I'm giving you these permissions, and if you want or need other permissions, you know, feel free to email me or call. <laughs> but make all the copies of this that you want to give to your students. Make a copy and post it in the learning management system. Make a copy of it and edit it. Translate it into Spanish if that's what your students need. Revise the reading level down if that's what your students need. Uh, you know, pull out the examples from Utah of high desert mountains if that doesn't make any sense to your students and put in examples that will make sense to them. And do all, make all those improvements and make your copies and then give them out. Give them to anyone who needs them. So open, when you hear the word open, I hope that you think about it in this way. That it doesn't mean that you just have uh, free access like you do to the internet where Everything is free for you, to, for you to look at, but in a kind of look but don't touch uh, kind of way. But open means that you have a free grant of these permissions. Uh, here's a, another piece of student work here. Um, now, I, I wish I could take credit for the word fopen. It's not my word. Um, fake open. And by FOPEN, we mean things that you get free access to, but free but probably gated access, where you have to create an account, you have to give up some personal information, like your email address, or you have to, your zip code, or something like that. Um, so there's some kind of wall that you have to penetrate. And after you've penetrated that wall, uh, the resources you find on the other side are not only all rights reserved, as opposed to granting you the 5R permissions, but they're also governed by terms of use or contract terms or something else that, that restricts your ability to use them even further than just copyright does. Um, so for example, in the Coursera terms of use, depending on which day of the week you look at them, because they do seem to update with some frequency, uh, there's a clause that says you may not use any of the material presented on this site in conjunction with any uh, you know, tuition bearing for credit kind of experience. So not only are, is the Coursera material not open in the sense that it grants me the 5R permissions, but I as a faculty member can't even tell my students, oh, you need to brush up on your Python, go over to Coursera and hit that and do the first, you know, f four or five weeks of that Coursera course because the Coursera terms of use preclude me as a faculty member who has students who are paying tuition from sending them over there as an official part of their credit earning experience at my institution. That's a restriction way beyond copyright. But when I have to create an account and gain access to things, then these terms of use can be applied over and above uh, the, all the rights that are reserved by copyright. So this is why we call this FOPEN. You'll hear people refer to things that they do as open. Uh, but if you look at it closely, a lot of times they're just trying to kind of Bless you, trying to ride the good marketing brand of open, but this is actually what they're giving you. They're not giving you permissions. They're giving you something that's free to look at but not touch, and they're actually restricting you further than copyright generally would. Um, you know, in terms of thinking about costs and, and permissions, um, you know, the web, I, I, well, you, you can see the slide. I just put this up here to kind of give you a quick way to compare and contrast. So as you're teaching your classes, when we think about making the choice to use traditionally copyrighted materials in a world of the internet, we're, we're putting ourselves, we're leaving ourselves in the situation where we're fighting this tension between what the internet gives us the technological capability to do, the copyright on our materials prevents us from doing. But when we make the choice to use open educational resources, we find ourselves in a place where everything the technology makes possible for us to do, the resources that we and our students work with give us the permission to do. So it opens up a, a broad kind of new range of possibilities. Um, let me give a couple of examples for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, OER and have never seen these in the wild. Um, 
you know, I've said a bit about what open means. Educational resources, of course, are courses or textbooks or chapters or videos or simulations or assessments. Um, you know, so here's an example, uh, OER. This is from a biology textbook uh, by OpenStax. Um, this is a simulation from the FET collection at Colorado, um, which is uh, an open educational resource. Some videos from Khan Academy. I expect many of you are familiar with uh, Khan Academy. And you know, here's some, both some open, content, open assessment content, but also an open source tool for delivering assessments uh, that not only presents them to students, but uh, also measures the amount of time that they spend answering each question and requires them to indicate their level of confidence in their answer before they move on so that instead of just right wrong on each question you get right wrong amount of time and level of confidence which um, if you're a psychometrician is kind of a gold mine. So OER run this kind of wide range of, of materials. Uh, sticking, sticking with the theme of defining terms now uh, we can finally talk about OER adoption. When I talk about OER adoption in the rest of the talk, what, what I mean is not asking your students to buy a, you know, a hundred or hundred fifty or two hundred dollar textbook and then providing a link to some OER as a supplemental resource. What I'm going to mean is I'm going to mean replacing whatever required materials were previously on your syllabus with open educational resources so that these are the primary resources we're using and we're actually displacing the cost of that previous textbook. So I want to talk about uh, kind of four pieces of this pattern of high impact OER adoption. The first being improving affordability. So uh, another piece of work here. I don't know if you're familiar with the Doge meme. This is one of my favorite memes. And there's a great piece of academic writing about the grammar of the Doge memes. That uh, if you're into this kind of thing is very fun. Uh, I expect many of you have seen this graph or a version of this graph somewhere. This one's from The Economist uh, looking at textbook prices compared to consumer prices. Uh, I think uh, the, the way that stu students' lived experience of, of this cost of textbooks looks something like this. You know, if I have ex an extra 20 or 30 bucks a month laying around, I could choose to use that in one of two ways. I could either procure one month of streaming access to most of the catalog of American movies, TV shows, and music, or for about 50% more, I could get access to one textbook. Right, so tens of thousands of movies and TV shows and millions of songs actually cost, uh, you know, about two-thirds of what it costs for one month of access to a textbook. This is the lunacy of textbook pricing. Any Ursula Le Guin fans in the room? Couple, anybody who feels, uh, anybody who could give us a 30 second summary of Wizard of Earthsea? Just to break it up so I'm not doing all the talking? No. Well, long before that derivative copycat Harry Potter went to Hogwarts, uh, this young wizard, uh, Sparrowhawk, went to the, the school on an island called Roke. Went to the school at Roke to learn to become a wizard. And part of the experience of becoming a wizard in this uh, universe is spending time, uh, spending a winter at what's called the Isolate Tower. And the Isolate Tower is on the for, far north, cold, windy part of the island. And you go there and what you do is you spend the whole uh, you spend your whole time there memorizing lists of names because in this magic system uh, learning the true name of a thing gives you complete mastery over it. And so this is a big part of wizardry is learning the name of every piece of every plant of every mountain and inlet and brook and everything in the whole world. And the way that this learning happens is that the master namer, who, one of the masters of Roke, provides you with a written list of names in the morning and at midnight everything on that list disappears. And you have between the time he hands it to you until the time it disappears to learn it. So it turns out to be highly motivating for all these students. Um, and I think it's kind of fun. Now why, why do I bring up, uh, why do I bring up Ursula Le Guin here? Because 
as you look around campus, most of the things that we do to try to ameliorate this problem of textbook costs are really disappearing ink strategies. Right? We tell students, uh, oh, you know, at the end of the term, just uh, sell your book back to the bookstore. Or in fact, don't even buy your book, just rent it. Uh, or don't even bother with a physical book, just go buy an access code to an online, you know, to a vital source or something like that. Just buy six months of access to a digital version of a book. But in, in all of these scenarios, whatever, uh, whichever specific one you prefer, at the end of the semester, the student's textbook disappears. And it's not lost on them that on, out of the left side of our mouth, we say to them, uh, you know, this course is so critically important that we will not allow you to graduate unless you take it. And out the right side of our mouth, we say, you're never going to need to think about any of this again. You sell that book back just the day the class is over. And they get it. They get it. Um, And there are, there are costs beyond financial costs, right? There are academic costs uh, of the high costs of textbooks. So this is from a survey of about 22,000 students. Uh, this survey from Florida. I can see in my notes it's 20,557. Um, asking them, you know, due to the, how does your behavior change due to the cost of textbooks? And you can see that it slows them down. They take fewer courses, they drop courses, they withdraw from courses, they earn poor grades in courses. Um, so there are academic costs here as well. So in terms of access and affordability, retain and redistribute really solve this problem. Right? As a faculty member, you can go find OER that you want to use instead of textbooks. You can make your own copy, you can own that copy forever, you can give, you can share c new copies of that with your students and they can keep it forever and it doesn't cost anyone anything because these permissions have been granted to you for free. Um, you know, the part of this that's the most exciting to me is the way that OER kind of invigorate pedagogy and let me say two things about that. One very briefly, um, in that any time we make a change we're invited to engage in some new thinking. Um, and a lot of OER adoption I think a lot of effective OER adoption really engages faculty in this process of backward design. Is that a term that you're familiar with, backward design? Starting with outcomes and saying, what is it that I want my students to be able to do by the time they leave this course? What do I care about them learning? And then for each of those outcomes that you specify saying, okay, now what is, the, what is there a student could do that would lead me to believe that they've actually achieved that outcome that I care about. So there's an assessment planning process with assessment map to each outcome. And then as you think, through, think your way through those assessments saying, okay, what kind of activities can I ask students to engage in that will prepare them to succeed? Uh, is it gonna be reading? Is it gonna be watching videos? Is it writing? Is it making videos? What, what kinds of things am I gonna ask them to do to support their learning? Um, and I think Josh and Mark are doing a workshop this afternoon that will talk about, or maybe later this morning, it's going to talk a little bit more about this. So I'm just going to pause here to say anytime we make a change in our life, it invites us to reflect uh, a bit. And so that's interesting. But I think more interesting is, uh, if you've heard this phrase, open pedagogy, I, I think more interesting is asking more direct questions about what is it that open allows me to do that I wasn't allowed to do before, or, or more specifically, if we say, you know, people learn when they do things, and we know that copyright, here I am, re I said I wasn't going to read off the slides, here I'm reading off the slide. Copyright restricts what we're able to do, and open takes those restrictions off. Open makes it so that we can do things we couldn't do before. So if people learn by doing things, and open lets us do new things, then, you know, will doing those new things impact learning in some way? Will students learn? different things? Will they learn more? Will they learn faster? Will they learn better? Um, it, it, we're kind of unlocked here. Open allows us to do new things. So let me give you one example of, of a family of things. And I'm doing a workshop this afternoon about this idea of, uh, uh, that I'm going to talk about right now. But I have, a, I have an issue in my own teaching with what I call disposable assignments. And disposable assignments are assignments where it's understood not explicitly, but it's understood implicitly by everyone involved in the, uh, in the interaction 
that the ultimate destiny of student work is the garbage can. That I'm going to go to a great amount of work to design some effective, you know, kind of homework or assignment, some kind of experience I'm going to ask them to do. They're going to spend a lot of time engaged in it. I'm going to spend a lot of time grading it, and then they're going to throw it away. Um, and I'm not saying that students don't learn from these. Of course, they do. They ha always have. Um, but it does, bless you, it does seem like a pretty big wasted opportunity. A quick back of the envelope, uh, I would say that students spend collectively, undergraduates only, and not time that they're reading outside of class, just time that they're actually doing work that we set for them, conservatively, something like 40 million hours every year, over and over again, that they do, that we grade, and then they recycle, hopefully. So, you know, is there kind of a different path through this? Is there some way that we could create assignments that students would see value in doing, that we, that they might enjoy doing, that we, wait for it, <laughs> might enjoy grading? Uh, and that at the end of that process, that it would actually add value to the world rather than just being thrown away. Um, you know, we, it's, it's easy to forget that students are people. And people enjoy feeling like their work matters. And like it's not all going to be ignored and, and thrown away at the end of the day. So, so how can we leverage open to get them to engage with this kind of work? Let me, let me give a couple of concrete examples. Um, if you've heard me talk before, you've probably heard me talk about this. This is one of my favorites. Uh, I have an assignment I call my Kung Fu assignment. Any, any Kung Fu fans like Jackie Chan, old Jackie Chan? Not like the recent stuff, the good stuff. Um, the, the defining kind of characteristic of a good Kung Fu movie uh, is that the movement of the mouth of people in the movie does, has nothing to do with the sound that <laughs> comes out. It's not even correlated, it seems like. Um, and so the idea of this Kung Fu assignment is instead of, you know, I originally used this to replace kind of a two-page compare and contrast kind of paper. Uh, this is a, a class on social media and learning. Um, instead of a two-page paper comparing and contrasting blogs and wikis, go find some open video, and it could be open either because, you know, it has a Creative Commons license on it, or in this case because it's public domain video where those copyright restrictions don't exist. Go find some, uh, some open video, write new audio for it, and then dub that audio over top of uh, the video to create something new that instead of doing whatever it was it did in the past, now teaches me something about whatever the topic is. In this case, it's going to teach me about blogs and wikis. And what this uh, group of three students did was they found this old Kennedy-Nixon debate footage. And they've put Kennedy on the side of wikis and Nixon on the side of blogs. Uh, it, it's about five minutes long. I'd show it to you, but we don't quite have the time. But if you just Google blogs versus wikis, it'll be the number one or number two search result that you'll find. Um, you know, Nixon is in favor of blogs because blogs are owned by a single person. You actually have control over the information that's on there and what's presented to the people and the media. He talks about the Watergate blog that he recently created so that he could control the flow of information about what happened there. Uh, and then Kennedy gets up and talks about wikis and how you know, everyone can contribute to wikis. It's about free speech. It's about promoting civic engagement and getting people involved. And uh, he ends by saying, ask not what your wiki can do for you, <laughs> but what you can do for your wiki. And that really sums up, it so beautifully sums up the difference between uh, blogs and wikis. Uh, that, you know, this, this would have been a throwaway piece of work that all three of those students would have done a two-page whatever and I would have graded it watching football or something and then given it back to them and instead you know we went through a process of a script and words and finding the right vehicle to communicate this message and what words should we have them say and what should they focus on and then actually and the the accents that they try to do are terrible the students try to do like a Nixon voice and a Kennedy voice it's really a lot of fun but, but you can see that what would have otherwise been thrown away turned into a YouTube video that's been watched 52,000 times. When I took the screenshot, I think it was 54 or 55 last time, I actually went and showed the video. 
Be because we chose open material, they were able to produce something that could get, then go out into the world. It wasn't just a video where they hacked a bunch of stuff together that was of questionable legality and I watched it and we, you know, the four of us had a laugh and then we deleted it. It's gone out into the world and had a life beyond the classroom and lots of people have enjoyed it and have learned from it. Um, you know, maybe a slightly more, if you can say traditional, uh, traditional example here is from another class I used to teach when I was still full time called Project Management for Instructional Designers. Um, I think this class is probably taught at about 50 schools around the country and the market for this is so small there is no textbook called Project Management for Instructional Designers. Um, but what we did in this class was we found, we found a, uh, an open textbook. We found a collection of OER that had been pulled together and made to look like a textbook, uh, which is what an open textbook is, about project management. But it was written for the business school context. You could tell from the little case studies and examples and things that were scattered throughout it. And it was very close to what my students needed, but it was not what they needed. And I was complaining to a colleague uh, about this when he essentially backhanded me and said, aren't you the open guy? Aren't you the permissions guy? Like if it's not the book you need it to be, change it and make it the book you need it to be. And I thought, wow, that sounds like a lot of work. I don't want to do that. <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> wait, wait, uh, there, there's a good idea here. So I, I redesigned this class uh, when I made the switch to this book in such a way that Instead of having students do the kind of work that they did before, I again broke them into groups and set them each with uh, the task of proposing a specific way that they, over the course of the semester, would work on transforming the course textbook from being a business school book to being an ed school book. And uh, so in that very first semester, the most obvious things were done. Like one group of students said, we'll take all the little yellow boxes that have examples in them that talk about trying to coordinate the logistics of getting rebar and concrete to Singapore coming from different ports. And we'll rewrite those so that there'll be examples about trying to get a faculty member, Smee, to actually deliver his content on time for an online course that we're building. And uh, we'll rewrite all the examples in the book. And you can imagine that you know, the level of understanding it takes for a student to actually write good new examples uh, compared to the level of understanding they need to be able to pass a multiple choice quiz, it, it's a higher bar. Um, it's a higher bar. So, you know, I broke them into teams and they each took on, you know, a strand of work that would carry throughout the term, throughout the book. Another group of students who were really interested in video said, it's 2000 whatever, there's no video in this book, it needs video. So they went out and found three practicing project managers who manage instructional design projects and created a set of questions that dealt with some topics from each chapter, shot video footage, uh, interviewing each of them on each of those topics, and then integrated that video. So now at the, at the head of each chapter, there's an ongoing series of three videos, uh, you know, one video for each person, where they talk for three or seven minutes about, uh, you know, some time when uh, Failure to manage people correctly resulted in a project imploding or something like that. And then in, in later terms, when more of those kind of obvious things got done, then students started doing other things like, uh, I always open this class, which isn't a class students are typically really excited about taking. Um, I open it by talking about the PMP certification, which is a, a project management cert certificate that you can earn. Um, that the, the group that runs that certification claims that the average salary for someone with that certificate is $106,000. So as soon as I say that, everybody's really excited to be in the class for about 30 minutes, al almost, almost that whole class period. But, um, but this, is a, you know, this is a big money exam. It's expensive to take. It's expensive to prepare for. Um, there are those giant paperback books like you've seen to prep for the GRE or whatever that exists for the PMP. Uh, exam. But so one group of students said, we want to go look at a bunch of those other books and see the kinds of things that they tell and ask students to do to prepare for the exam. And then we want to kind of reverse engineer this book and organize it in such a way that a person could prepare to take the exam using this book instead of having to go buy 
$180 PMP exam prep book. So they, you know, over the semesters, they've done a wide range of interesting things uh, to the book, and they all know that if their work hits a minimum level of quality, that it's actually going into the book. They're co-authoring the textbook that they're using and that the students that come after them will use. And now this book, because there, is, because there was no other book uh, in this area, this book is used at a lot of institutions around the country. And so uh, if you hit this page and scroll down to the bottom, you'll see a lengthy list of authors of the book that includes uh, many of the students who have come through the class. So that's a pretty exciting proposition for them. So these kind of renewable uh, assignments, renewable assessments are all enabled by these permissions, right? If this was a typical Pearson, Cengage, McGraw book on project management, we couldn't have just cracked it open, taken all the examples out, put new examples in, integrated video in, restructured it uh, to support studying for the PMP exam. These things are all possible because of these permissions. These are new things now that we can do. And I have to tell you, it's so much that the difference between feeling like an editor supporting students who are doing work that they know is going to go into a textbook and the difference between feeling like a grader of assignments that you know are going to be thrown away as soon as you finish grading them, uh, it's, it's a different way of engaging with students as a faculty member. It can actually be enjoyable and feel like you're adding value to the world, not just pouring out your soul on an essay that they're never even going to read the feedback and they're going to throw it away. And students engage in a different way too. In, in this course, I always ask the students at the end of the term uh, two questions, which IRB would probably never allow me to do. But um, I ask them, was your grade ever in doubt in this class? Like, how much time did you spend worrying about your grade in this class? And they say, actually, you know, I didn't spend a lot of time worrying about my grade in this class. And then I ask them, was there any course that you took this semester you spent more time on than you spent on this class? And then they get this wonderful look on their face where they realize that they've been snookered somehow. And why did I spend so much time on this class when I wasn't worried about my grade? Like, how did you trick me into doing that? What, what happened here? <laughs> and what happened was they were doing good work that they knew was going to go out and have a life and, and be seen and used by other people. And it just leads them, without even realizing it, to engage in a completely different way. Um, you know, doing it at scale, um, scale is a super, super dangerous word. I've become a big fan of this phrase, worshiping at the altar of scale. I, I think a lot of the educational technology products that are being created currently are being created mainly for the purpose of moving humans out of the equation of teaching and learning because humans are expensive, of variable quality, and don't scale. Um, so we should, anytime in the educational context you hear someone use the word scale, you should panic immediately until they persuade you that they're a, a reasonable human being with good intentions, uh, which I hope to do over the next three slides. Um, are you familiar with this idea of OER-based degrees, or OER degrees, or Z degrees as they're called sometimes? So again, defining terms, the idea of an OER degree is when a sufficient number of elective courses and all of the required courses in a degree program have some sections of them offered uh, where the faculty member has assigned OER instead of traditional publisher materials. So that a student who's paying attention as they register each term can go from their first day as a student through graduation without ever being asked to buy a textbook because there's an entire OER pathway that's available to them. The first of these was created at Tidewater Community College. It started uh, in the fall of 2013. And uh, this is uh, some information from their website about what they call the Z degree or the zero textbook cost degree. Um, and you can see here they're comparing tuition, uh, in-state in tuition, uh, with in-state tuition plus the cost of textbooks and saying that, that they think that they're OER degree takes about 25% off the cost to graduate. Um, this is a two-year degree in business administration. Um, 
But can you think of anything else that you could do that could take that much off the cost to graduate? I mean, moving tuition, moving fees, that involves boards and trustees and legislators and an act of God or Congress or something. Um, you can't do anything about housing. But, but textbooks is something that you as a fa that we as faculty can just say, I'm going to choose to do this instead of that. And if a group of faculty come together and as a group say, we're going to do this instead of that, then this is, this is what can happen. Uh, the first of these launched at Tidewater in uh, 2013, followed that same year, followed very quickly by work at Northern Virginia, which was also quite successful, uh, which then led to uh, the Z times 23 work at the Virginia Community Colleges. So the community college system for Virginia, which is 23 schools, said we each need at least one of these uh, and started a project to do that. Uh, that led to some work coordinated by Achieving the Dream, which is a, a membership, a membership uh, organization for community colleges uh, that just funded earlier this year where they funded more OER degree work at 38 colleges around the country. And over the summer, Governor Brown in California signed uh, some budget language setting aside money for, depending on how they spend it, between 20 and 25 colleges in California. Uh, to create OER degrees there. So this is work that is starting to scale now. It's not an individual faculty member saying, oh, I'm going to use OER instead of my traditional textbook, which is awesome. And the student experience of that is to come in and sit down and find out, wait, what? I don't have to buy a textbook? And it's like getting extra whipped cream on your pumpkin pie or something. It's a great surprise, but it's not something that you can plan for. Right? When the institution makes a commitment, when the faculty come together and say, we're going to do this in such a way that there's a complete pathway through the degree, now I can arrange to work fewer hours. I can arrange to take out fewer student loans. I, I, I can actually plan for this now because it, it's not just a hit or miss. There, you know, somebody might have adopted an open textbook. There's been this kind of group commitment to create this degree experience. Um, and what nobody has done yet, which I think would be really interesting for UB to try, I've got a question mark down here for you, is a gen ed pathway. There's not a four-year school that's made an institutional commitment in this way yet. And I think what would be really fascinating would be, instead of trying to do an entire degree program, say, we're going to commit that regardless of what major you're from, there is a pathway through the, gen the required general education experience there where you can go two years without ever being asked to buy a textbook. That wouldn't just impact one degree, it would impact every student on campus. How are we doing on time? Just, just a couple more. Okay, good. Only, only one more point to make. Um, this is, I think you all know Grumpy Cat. Um, there, there's, there's a definite feeling that because open educational resources can be copied for free, shared for free, um, that they must be lower quality. Because your moms all taught you that you get what you pay for. The difference between a $10 stereo and a $1,000 stereo is that the $1,000 stereo is a lot better. So let me, let me breeze very quickly, because I've, I've run a little longer than I should have here, through two studies. Um, and now this is wearing my, my research hat group. This is the work that I still do as an adjunct at BYU. Um, so I'll, I'll just put some information up and make a comment or two about it. So this is, this is not a small study. This is 16,000-ish students across 10 institutions. Um, you know, propensity score matched groups looking at a couple of variables that we think are interesting. Completion, see or better, credits enrolled this term and next term. And we're balancing across age, gender, and race for students. The important thing to look at here is all of the NSs all over this screen. NS everywhere here means no significant difference. And what we're asking here is the rate of student completion in classes where faculty assigned OER compared to other sections of the same class in the same semester where faculty assigned traditional publisher materials. Basically, no difference in completion except for these two cases where the treatment group outperformed the control group. Students who were assigned OER completed at higher rates than students who were assigned uh, traditional publisher materials. And now you can read the rest of it. This is completion as a yes or no. This is C, C minus or better final grade as a yes or no. 
And this is final grade zero to four on a GPA scale. Um, the big takeaway from the study is that we can save students tons of money and do no harm. No difference in outcomes. Uh, there are a couple of cases where the students who are assigned OER do better. And then there's this one interesting case where the students who are assigned traditional publisher materials did better than students who were assigned OER. And I'm going to come back to that in a second. Now, we have some survey work from students asking them, what do you do with the money that you save when your faculty assign you OER instead of a traditional textbook? And we were kind of surprised because students put their hands over their hearts and told us some uh, very, some things that we didn't really know how to respond to. They, this one actually came out a lot. I buy fresh fruit, I buy healthier food, I buy better groceries. Um, but a lot of students also said, I take that money that I saved and I reinvest it by taking more classes. You say, okay. Now remember, the, 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 the context of, I, actually I probably skipped over it, the context of this, this study is community colleges where there is no full-time tuition tier. They have to pay for every additional credit. And so we looked at that at, across these 16,000 students and what we did find, in fact, was that in the semester where they were assigned to use OER, the students who were assigned to use OER took over two credits more than the students in other sections of the same courses at the same institution in the same term who were assigned traditional publisher materials. Now there might be other things going on there, um, but over, over two credits more. Moving quickly. Um, these red boxes. These red boxes led us to go back and see what was going on here, and as we looked at this course, the, uh, the materials for that course were so expensive that the drop rate among students in the traditional publisher material sections of that course is very high. And when we got to the end to compare the completion rate and compare final grades, in the traditional publisher section we had kind of a selected subset of students. And in the OER section we had basically everybody who had shown up at the beginning. Um, and so we asked ourselves, you know, is there a way that we can try to model all of that in a, in a single measure? And so if you think about this, you know, depending on which discipline you come from, this can be a medieval gauntlet or it can be an e-commerce funnel, either way you like it. Um, you know, as students come into courses, they have to survive the drop deadline, they have to survive the withdrawal deadline, and they have to earn a final grade that is high enough for them to apply that course toward graduation. Uh, this study is actually done at Tidewater. There are about 35,000 students in this study. And we have face-to-face -face and online results here. But basically what you see is traditional publisher materials on the left, OER on the right. There is a difference in drop. It's not huge. There's a difference in withdrawal that's a little bigger. There's a difference in see or better. And when you aggregate all that together to ask the question of all the students who showed up on day one, what proportion of them make it to the end of the class and receive a grade that's going to be high enough to allow them to count that course toward graduation? That OER, the sections where faculty assign OER come out about six points higher. Both in face-to-face -face and if we look at online, it all slides down, uh, but still again about six points higher in online settings as well. Um, OpenEdGroup.org is our research group website. Um, we've collected uh, at this slash review, we have what is essentially a live literature review that we update a couple times a year, a couple times a year with all the results from all the empirical studies of the impact of OER adoption on a range of student outcomes. I'd encourage you to go there and check that out. Um, more fun student work here. Um, and with that, I think I'll just kind of skip through here. This is summary. High impact OER adoption can do all of these things. Uh, Mark and Josh will talk more about, in a workshoppy kind of way, about that after the break. When you think of the open and open educational resources, remember it doesn't just mean free, like free to read or free to look at or free like the internet. It means a free grant of permissions to engage in these activities. And that's got us right to the hour. Thank you. Can we do a couple questions? Okay. Okay, a couple, couple of questions, please. So, you know, on the first side, I think, um, I think everything that, if, if you think about open as being a grant of permissions, then anything that could have permissions associated with it, we should have a conversation about whether or not it makes sense to grant people those permissions. Um, so not just materials, but also assessments. 
Also, uh, in discussion questions that you might use either in class or online. Um, any, any kind of, anything that you might capture, you know, should that be open or not? And if it was, uh, like if we opened assessments, how could we share assessments with each other in a way that student couldn't just go to Google, type it in, and find the answer to it, right? So that there are some interesting questions about how to do that well. How can we, because I think it's really about supporting broader collaboration both inside the institution, but in some ways more interestingly, cross-institutionally with other faculty in the discipline to be able to tweak and revise and improve your assessment strategy, the way that you talk about things, the examples that you use. Um, so I, I think there are ways that we can push on all of that in ways that are productive. Now questions about the future, the university's future business model. I don't know that I have anything super intelligent to say about that. Um, I th other than to say I think it's gonna be very tricky because when the content's free and the assessment questions are free, now there are issues of security and verification and things like that, we do have to step back and ask, what is the value that we add to that equation? Is the university more than the library? I mean, the library is a bunch of free content, right? So what, you know, what value do you add? What value do I add? And how do we justify to students? You should pay, because it's not just a book and a multiple choice test. There's more here. We need to be, we need to be better about articulating what that is, why and how it's valuable. Um, but as that, yeah, it's gonna be very interesting going forward. But I think the onus is on us to explain to people who say, wow, the whole internet is free. Why do I have to pay to go to college? The, the onus isn't on them to, ex to answer that question. It's on us to answer that question. Yeah. That, it, where, where, where does all that go? I, I would argue that they're, they're not ignoring it, that they've actually already given up um, on kind of static content, like textbooks. Uh, the Open, OpenStax makes an A&P book. I don't know if you've seen it. It's very good. The YouTube channel, The Noted Anatomist, has fabulous video with great artwork and great voiceover, and it moves and shows you. There, there's tons of res raw resources out there. Um, and my view is that the, the publishers, although they haven't said it yet, it, it's like there's three minutes left in the game and they're down 28. I mean, they're not going to walk off the field, but they understand where they are. Strategically, where they're going is they're going away from static content to interactive systems like MyLabs and MindTap and these other kind of homework platforms where um, because it's digital, they can exert perfect control over it. Unlike a textbook where if you buy, then you can trade textbooks with another student later on and they don't have to make a purchase and you cut the publisher out of the deal and there's a secondary market and whatever else happens. If I only offer digital, and in the digital I bundle in the way that you're supposed to uh, submit your homework, you can't share access codes. You can't give that to someone else. I can Per, I can exercise perfect control over that sphere. And you see them migrating very quickly to models like that, which they will describe to you as being higher value and better. And there are some things about them that are interesting, right? Immediate feedback for students it is great when that can be done. Uh, less time spent grading for you gives you more time to talk and argue and have office hours and do the things that you like to do. Um, but it's a pretty bitter pill to say, hey, we have a couple of these little improvements for you, and the only cost to that is giving up any control whatsoever or choice around options that students might have had. Um, and so where you're gonna see this going in the future is how can we provide those benefits of immediate feedback and things like that in a way that's true to the values of open, uh, but publishers are ahead of open by two or three years. They're not very far ahead, but they are ahead of us on, on that piece. Thanks, David. Very good, thank you.